Good afternoon, dear experts and participants here in Milano, and uh, welcome back after our lunch break, also to our participants online. Thank you for being with us, ready to continue with our session for the second part of day two. We are advancing with uh, module six on business process analysis that Virginia and Claudia started to present and discuss this morning with two panelists, Simone Giuliani from Candiani and Emanuele Riva from Accredia. And here, I would like to share with you just two uh, takeaways from their interventions to introduce the session this afternoon. Over 1,000 visitors per year at Candiani Danin, a fabric producer here in Italy from industry partners meaning that their suppliers and their clients want to know more about what happens in their value chain, and this is encouraging. And from Accredia, consumers' awareness surely is important, but it takes time to change consumption habits. So governments and regulators need to underpin the process and push consumers and industry actors through standardized minimum requirements. So let's continue with our session on business process analysis. And I call on stage uh, Virginia, Virginia Cram Martus, to introduce our speakers. And uh, the session that uh, we are going to have for the next uh, one and a half hours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Maria Teresa. Well, <coughs> could we? Uh, No. Where's this nice picture? Well, that was a really nice picture of Deborah and Marco and Piera, but <laughs> so, but we're going to have a, 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 a presentation in several parts. Ah, there we are. Thank you. We're going to have a presentation in several parts now. We're going to start with Deborah, who's going to talk about. Deborah Taylor, who's going to talk about her work on preparing the business process analysis for the leather value chain. And then Marco is going to talk about the work that he did on preparing the textile value chain business process analysis. Then we're going to turn to Piera, so Francesca Solinas, who is going to introduce some polls so that you get to provide us with some input. And she's going to talk to us about risk analysis, which is an important aspect of business process analysis and also traceability and transparency and focusing your resources on the areas that need the most attention. And then we'll turn back again to Deborah Taylor, who's going to talk to us <clears throat> about identifying in your value chain using your business process analysis the data points where, that are the key data points for collecting data that you need for, for traceability. So with that quick introduction, I'm going to turn the floor over to Deborah. And uh, hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. I've been involved with the Secretariat now on this project for the last 18 months. It's really rewarding, but it's also really great to see the engagement grow as we progress as a team. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be here to tell you a little bit more about the work we've been doing. Um, this module is quite technical, but there is a layering effect to the information. So I'm going to start us off right at the beginning. Um, and we're going to look at preparing the processes and the actors and that use case diagram that Virginia introduced us to in the first session. So, easy slide. Um, these are the processes that we uh, agreed in the leather value chain as being the general processes involved from the start with farming through to post-consumption. It looks quite simple. It's actually not. You know, there are variances within this. There are uh, different production models and methods that take place. And I touched on it earlier as one of the challenges that we had um, in creating the alignment. 
So you'll see as we go through, uh, if we look at the first process there, farming of livestock, that looks quite straightforward. Actually, there's a number of different methods of farming that we have to take into account. But for now, creating uh, a more broad process term was what was required in this uh, part of the process. And once we'd identified um, what we thought these processes should include, we then put that out to stakeholder consultation. 65 leather value chain consultants reviewed the descriptive work that we put together with these use case diagrams. And those stakeholders included brands, they included associations that are involved in the leather industry, uh, NGOs and IGOs that have a wealth of experience in the leather industry. And that was really important for us because for this to be successful in the long term, we need that engagement. And that's why that, that importance of alignment is, is so intrinsic to the process. So let's now take those key processes and put them onto, oh, go back one, uh, put them onto a use case diagram. Ginia explained this morning, the processes are in those center ovals. So they're the 11 sections that we already showed you in the previous slide. And then we layer this diagram now with the actors involved in those processes. There's two distinct sides here. You've got the process initiators, so they're the direct people that are involved in those processes. And on the right-hand side, we have the other service providers and suppliers that support that work and enable it to take place, but they don't crucially own the material. That's how we layer this use case diagram. Now, this is a very simple one that, that we put the whole of the leather production in that center oval there as one process. In actual fact, it's far more complex than that, and I'll show you on the next slide. We also tried to color code this work to make it a little bit simpler for people to read. And so the yellow ovals are the upstream processes and the blue ovals that you can see there are the downstream processes. So it's important when we um, are working through with the different actors that we understand where they sit within that leather value chain perspective. So let's move on to this next uh, chart, which really kind of um, gives a simpler overview. That middle section of, of raw to finished manufacture of leather can be achieved in a number of different methods and a number of different ways. And so we kind of broke it out in this diagram to show you that each one of those individual parts of the process can be done in its own right by a completely different uh, facility. So the ownership of the material could go through four or five different hands before it goes on to become that product at the product manufacturer side. Equally, you could have one owner of the material, but that owner could subcontract out all of those processes to other organizations to prepare on his behalf. This is really important because this is what gives you an understanding of your potential for risk. And we're going to talk about risk in a few minutes. But if you've got a controlled uh, value chain and you've got one tannery that's taking your material right through from the raw to the finished, then your potential for risk is, is minimal. If you're going through five or six different pairs of hands before it reaches the store, then your potential for risk is much greater. So it's really important that we understand the complexities, but still draw that back into a way that can be understood by people who are looking at this documentation. And I think with that, I'd like to hand over to Marco, and he can tell you a little bit about the, uh, the cotton side of this and the textile side of, of this first piece of work that we did. And then we'll move on to the next layer, which is assigning those risks and, and looking at that. Marco, over to you. Well, good morning to everyone. Oh, sorry, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I will try to, to give you very briefly uh, and trying to keep it short uh, a few hints about the, the structure, uh, 
of the, the work we, we have been uh, doing, and also provide, we try to provide you with some uh, suggestion about how to, to use it. Uh, well, the first, the first point uh, is that to identify the, uh, the specific processes. Uh, we have decided to uh, provide a simplified uh, structure of the, of the processes. Identif we identified 11 processes that goes from the raw material production down to uh, consumption. Uh, a, a first uh, caveat is that this type of uh, structure of processes is actually uh, general. You can find uh, supply chains or value chains that can have uh, different uh, structures. Uh, for example, this, this morning, Virginia, Virginia has mentioned the role of finishing that can uh, be located in uh, different steps in the, in the value chain. In this case, you see the finishing processes that are located between the spinning and the weaving uh, activities. You can have uh, uh, value chains when, where the, the dyeing is made before spinning, so materials are dyed in mass. In other situations, you may have the, the, uh, 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 the finishing, so the, the, the printing or the dyeing even made at the end of the textile of the manufacturing part, and it can be done directly on the on the garment. So uh, these first the first things uh, must be done uh, in in a business process analysis is to understand uh, what is the specific structure uh, of the value chain you are you are looking uh, to. Uh, well, another point here is that. Uh, uh, you, you have to take into consideration who is, is performing uh, these uh, steps, these processes. Uh, you may have the, the case where um, a single process is split in two different companies because, uh, as I said this morning, textiles, uh, the fashion value chain is uh, super fragmented, uh, and there are uh, different ways to, uh, to uh, interact among the companies. But you, you can also have a, an opposite uh, case uh, is when more than one or two uh, of these uh, processes are made by a single uh, vertically integrated company. So uh, this stage, the analysis of the processes along all the supply chain, as I, as I said, from the production of raw material down at least to retailing, but uh, you also have to take into consideration where, what happens, what, what can happen to your product when they are consumed and they get uh, to their uh, end of life. So take into consideration all the wool, the wool the of, of, of the value chain and try to identify which is the specific structure and sequence of the, um, the, um, uh, the, the company or the brand, say the brand that you are uh, working on uh, is made. Uh, well, you, you can uh, con take in also, uh, uh, pay your attention to the fact that we have three broad groups of processes uh, and why we decided to, uh, to, to show the difference between the, these three uh, broad group of processes. Well, because uh, the uh, the, the structure of uh, the, uh, the processes and also the type of risk that are, co that, that are connected to each of these processes uh, uh, can be very different in this three group, while can be quite similar in the different processes uh, belonging to the same group. So the three, the three groups are the, uh, let's say, the production of the fiber, so the creation of the new materials, uh, which is not such a simple uh, uh, animal because you can find there uh, the primary sector, agriculture, but you can also have a totally different business, which is the chemical industry. And so uh, this uh, deserves uh, specific uh, uh, attention. Uh, within this first group uh, of processes, uh, however, you still have three very different Component. First is the, uh, the, uh, the initiating uh, of the uh, activity. So in agriculture is uh, planting, okay? 
uh, in, in chemicals is uh, uh, creating the, the, the batch fiber, for example. Uh, then uh, uh, you have uh, the, uh, the preparation of these uh, fibers, both in agriculture and in chemicals. And finally, you have a number of activities that you, you know, are, are on the boundaries between uh, primary sector, for example, and industry. Take uh, uh, ginning for the cotton, for example, which is actually some sort of manufacturing activities, but his, his role is only to prepare the fiber for the transformation within the textile uh, industry. Then we have uh, the, the, the manufacturing uh, component uh, that, of course, we can, someone can say, well, but textiles is different from uh, garment manufacturing. Yes, of course, we can also uh, identify two different groups, but nevertheless, this is all about manufacturing at least. Uh, then uh, we have the, the, the third component that maybe is the less explored at the moment, which is uh, the, the, the part that includes both the retailing component uh, and logistic to retail, nowadays including, of course, e-commerce, which is not such a simple uh, uh, process to, 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 to analyze, and even the consumption part. Consumption is not something outside the value chain, Consumption is something you need to be, that need to be uh, um, uh, explored from the point of view of sustainability. Think of all the debate on, <laughs> on fast fashion versus, uh, let's say, traditional uh, seasonal uh, model, business models. And then, even more important, in the next few years, maybe this is totally unknown or almost totally unknown at the moment, uh, which is the... Uh, the uh, uh, the recycling and post-consumption recycling, especially, uh, component. <clears throat> well, uh, let me concentrate just for a moment on, on, the, on, on, on the fiber production. Uh, well, this component, uh, as you see, uh, all the components of, of the fiber production merge in the, in the manufacturing part. Uh, and let's say that uh, this is a very important uh, issue which is when you take into consideration the final product, so you are trying to, uh, to uh, analyze the business processes for uh, the, a brand value chain, okay, you find, I mean, if I look at my, my, my jackets, this is not something you can trace back to a single uh, uh, raw material. You know that there are, there are, there are analyses that show that a single jacket can be done uh, can be include uh, five, six different fibers, even more, if it is simple, I think. Uh, so uh, uh, when you make this type of, of, of analysis, you always, almost always, uh, find the necessity to include different components for the fiber production. So uh, for this jacket, I, if I want to make some um, claim, I have to take into consideration the plant-based, this is linen, you know, it's also the plant-based uh, part, but also you have the, the internal sleeve that is made of cellulosic man-made uh, fiber. So this is an, another critical point. You're always busy with working with more than one uh, single, uh, single fiber. Then, as a, I think as a last uh, comment I would like to make, is that as uh, uh, has been already uh, 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 clarified. Well, there are a lot of uh, subjects uh, or agents that are involved in the in, in the uh, in, in the value chain. So they have uh, they make actions. They have different interests. They uh, they request information. They provide information. Uh, so you and the, the the type of subject are very. Uh, uh, very various. Some, some of them are internal to the, to the anyway to the uh, to the supply chain or to the value chain. Farmers, uh, raw material traders, uh, suppliers of chemicals, spinners, uh, consumers. Others are in a way external, so they are, can be busy with more than uh, one sector. So they are less uh, uh, aware or informed about the 
specificities of, this, of the textile industries, uh, such as, for example, the uh, transporters, uh, waste recyclers, etc. And then you have, you know, the, the, the last part, which uh, is made of people that has just the role of uh, collecting uh, information from, uh, and verifying information, and uh, probably in, in other, uh, providing IDs. Sorry, Virginia, I was forgetting this point. Uh, that is not minor. And then also to set the standards. Uh, this morning, uh, we have see, uh, heard about the different uh, ISO standards that can be applied. And of course, you have all the standards and protocols from uh, the certification uh, organization. These guys here, this type of subject, are, uh, let's say, totally outside the industry. And they have, so they're not involved directly in the, in the activities, that, that, but they play a critical role in uh, providing what we need, so information about what happens, uh, or, or the five uh, W that are part of, of uh, our uh, system for uh, traceability and transparency. Well, that's all for my part. Any questions is, is welcome. Bye. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody, uh, in presence and uh, online, or good morning, wherever you are in the globe. Uh, so it has been already uh, introduced by Virginia before that during this part of the session, we will uh, proceed with identifying key sustainability risks, uh, also define uh, the environmental and socioeconomic impacts uh, that they have along the value chain, the so-called hotspots, uh, and see uh, existing initiatives that are many that uh, are uh, working to address them. Therefore, um, we would like uh, uh, in this part of the session to for you to consider two key areas uh, when developing your business process analysis, and we would like to ask you some questions and to uh, launch uh, a poll. In particular, we have uh, some questions that we would like to ask you about, first of all, uh, evaluating uh, uh, what are your sustainability risks, and in particular, uh, we would like to ask you what do you consider to be your main priority in terms of sustainability. Uh, it has been already said before uh, this morning uh, that for answering the polls, uh, people online, uh, people in presence can go and uh, uh, scan the QR code. Uh, online instead, they can just click the button on the screen uh, and join the poll. So again, the first question about evalu um, evaluating risks uh, is, relates to your priorities uh, in uh, sustainability. And uh, the second uh, set of questions instead relates more about that exchange for traceability. Uh, the first one is what you consider to be minimum uh, m acceptable methods related to raw material sourcing and origin. And you have uh, a choice. Remember that you can give only one answer. It's a limitation that we have in the system. We understand very well that, of course, uh, your priority in terms of sustainability will not only be one, but uh, you know, we will discuss then uh, when we receive uh, the answers of the polls and we will uh, go in more detail. So the first one related to raw material sourcing and origin. And the second one instead related to sustainability claims uh, and production processes. So you have to select uh, what is the methods or the documentation that it, in your opinion is the minimum you can accept to prove traceability or sustainability of uh, a product. Of course, we know very well that there are a lot of implications such as geographic locations and so but uh, please participate to the poll and then uh, together with the colleagues we will comment uh, also uh, the results. So, before we start, uh, I just want to refer to uh, the sources that we adopted and we used to prepare this presentation and of course for the business process analysis when we speak about risk and mitigation of risks and the documents and the reports that we have been looking at are the documents from the OECD, documents from the ITC, from the UNIP and the UNEC of course. 
So uh, in this, I don't want to suggest answers now for uh, <laughs> the post that we just launched, but uh, here is a, a slide that is uh, uh, basically summarizing all the sustainability risks that go across both textile and leather value chains. At the, at the top, we have those that are more connected with the processes, and at the bottom, you find all uh, the risks that go uh, cross-cutting to the entire value chain. So now let's have a little bit of, uh, let's look in detail about uh, uh, what a hotspot is uh, in, the, in uh, the textile. I will concentrate more on the textile now and then uh, my colleague uh, Deborah will make uh, um, the point instead on, uh, on leather. So a hotspot normally is a stage in the life cycle of a product that accounts for a significant part of its environmental, social or economic impact. So of course understanding where the hotspots are in our value chain or supply chain is critical to identify the corrective actions. So that is why the um, business process analysis report provide uh, a matrix where uh, hotspots, where sustainability uh, risks are presented and they are spotted uh, exactly where they happen in uh, the different processes. Here you can see the pre-textile manufacturing processes and you can see as a sort of example that insecticide, pesticide and fertilizer of course happen uh, mainly in plant cultivation in uh, raising of animals, uh, in extraction of cellulose, uh, and uh, so on. I mean, I don't want to uh, go in detail uh, about each one, but uh, this uh, matrix in the business process analysis provides uh, a, very, a very useful uh, and important, uh, let's say, guide to start uh, locating and localizing the hotspots in the different, uh, in the value chain. Here it's about the textile manufacturing processes. Uh, just one point, uh, you might have noticed is that uh, human rights and labor rights, uh, which is the social part uh, of the sustainability risks happen, you know, uh, almost in all the um, processes and uh, uh, of the value chain. Here you find the summary that is a good reference as well uh, about uh, the hotspots. Uh, you, we see in detail that in fiber production, we have a very high use of fossil fuels, a high use of agrochemicals, land and water to produce, of course, natural fibers, especially cotton. Uh, and uh, as said before, we re register, of course, unsafe working conditions. In the yarn, fabric and textile production, uh, again, high uh, use of fossil fuels, uh, uh, heat for the heat and electricity needed. And then we will see how all this uh, impact each uh, stage of the value chain in terms of percentages uh, against the global. The use phase, of course, uh, has a, a big impact as well uh, for the use of electricity in the care of textile uh, over their lifetime and uh, also high use of water and releases of microfibers uh, uh, in washing textile over their lifetime. Uh, end of life, we have low rates of uh, recovery of textile. Of course, uh, I, I guess the recycle is below the 13% of the global uh, uh, consumption, so uh, the, the, also the impact is low because uh, the recycling is low. Um, Deborah, would you like to say something about the, 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 this slide on uh, the leather value chain? This is a visualization of how the risks will vary according to where you sit on that value chain in the process. But what's also really important to remember is that what happens in one facility might not be the same as even the facility next door to you. So this is why the, the whole BPA as a, as a topic is so important. And if we look at deforestation as an example there, you can see that deforestation as a risk applies to the farming of livestock. However, it doesn't apply to every tannery in every case. If you've got a tannery in Europe that's sourcing from European farms, that are going through and are certified through um, the system here in Europe, the potential for risk uh, of, of deforestation is very minimal. However, if you're sourcing your material from, uh, from Brazil or other areas of South America, 
your potential for risk of deforestation is very high. So you can't assume the same risks will apply in a blanket fashion across all of your uh, supply chain. And it's really important that you do this risk analysis work based on your criteria. The same with greenhouse gas emissions. If you're, if you're working really locally, then your emissions are going to be much lower than a large organization that is sourcing globally. Um, so as a rough idea, uh, you can see at the top there, again, the risks that are specific to certain parts of the value chain, but not necessarily always. But those bottom risks are the ones that are consistently uh, there across the whole value chain and will apply whatever we're doing. So it's just really important to recognize where those risks occur and where there might be regional variances. You know, India's uh, environmental risk is water scarcity, for example. They're not going to be worrying about deforestation, but they are going to be worrying about water scarcity. So you have to apply these principles within the context of your own organization. Thanks a lot, Deborah. Yes, of course, uh, uh, again, uh, the geography of where uh, activity happen is very important. So the, the geographic uh, location is very important because uh, we have different, different impact also according to where things uh, are made. Now, I, okay. Uh, uh, let's have a look now at this, uh, at the climate impact. I, ch I selected the climate impact because it's one of the major, of course, uh, uh, across the global upper value chain. Uh, and uh, as you can see, mm, the energy intensive textile production stages account for the majority of the climate impact. Uh, and uh, because the wet processing stages, uh, of course, uh, they need a lot of electricity to uh, heat the water that is used uh, for uh, dyeing and finishing. And so that is why the, we have, uh, of course, a big, uh, a big uh, um, part of the impact. Um, again, I, I want to say that we have to consider why developing our strategies and while analyzing the risks along our uh, value chain, uh, the geographies. So where the, the geographic location both for origin of materials but also for uh, where processes happen as this can bring about relevant changes while calculating the impact. If you take for instance Asian countries that are that produce the majority of uh, certain also intermediate products such as textile and, and yarns uh, such as China, India and Bangladesh we will all see that we have uh, of course uh, they, they rely heavily on uh, fossil fuel for energy, uh, for energy generation. So, of course, the impact uh, is quite big. So, we see in the first position, we have uh, energy intensive textile stages that account for the main part of the, of the climate, uh, uh, of the impact on climate. Uh, then we have the use of, uh, of clothes uh, uh, that ranks second. And also the use of clothes, of course, uh, the LCA on this will vary and will change according according to where the clothes are used and according to the behavior according to the behavior of consumers because in different countries and the climate also of the country where clothes are used because uh, according to the climate and the behavior of the consumers, clothes are used and washed uh, more frequently or less frequently. The third uh, uh, is related to fiber production. That, of course, comes third uh, in relation mainly to, um, not to natural fibers, but to man-made fibers. We have adapted this slide, uh, putting a negligible in end of life. Uh, and I guess Marco has something to say about that. Please, Marco. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Pierre. I just would like to, to comment on, on uh, the negligible uh, statement on the end of life. Uh, this, of course, is due uh, to, the, to the tool that has been used for measuring the impact. That is a standard LCA uh, approach. Uh, that follows an ISO standard, and that takes into consideration only uh, the impact during the production process. They don't take into consideration the impact after consumption. So when you say end of life, what does it mean in this case? It means that uh, they, uh, the LCA studies, study has considered the incineration or landfilling of the, the, the garment to the end of life uh, as, a, as a cost 
has calculated the cost and the impact on the, uh, on the, uh, on, on the climate uh, change and has considered only this cost. It doesn't take into consideration what happens to, to the nature with the waste or the, it doesn't take into consideration the, all the topic of the discussed and controversial topic of uh, microplastic in the, in the oceans, etc. So this is just to mention that when I was referring before and also this morning to the difficulties to model the process for uh, post-consumption and uh, post-consumption recycling, uh, well, you see that the most used tools for measuring the impacts actually are not ready to, uh, to take into consideration these very important parts that will be even more important in the next year, given that starting from the European Green Pact, for example, the circular approach is considered one of the key factors in the evaluation of the sustainability of the supply chain. Thanks, Marco. It's very important to make uh, this point. Uh, we are still, uh, I mean, um, we are uh, uh, progressing with measuring uh, impacts uh, and uh, evaluate, but we are still far from reaching uh, the real dimension of what, uh, of what are uh, uh, the impacts on environment and social aspects and so on. So uh, uh, the other slide that I want to share with you on the impact uh, uh, is related to freshwater withdrawal across the global upper value chain. And uh, as you can see, of course, uh, we have uh, the use uh, of clothes, uh, apparel, uh, that ranks first for water use. Uh, again, I want to, to, to specify that uh, this research uh, and these numbers might change according to the countries uh, where uh, this, uh, this is an average, 35% uh, on the total, but uh, might change according to where the research is carried out. Uh, the, th the second, uh, uh, in terms of water use, is the wet processes that uh, uh, are used, uh, uh, that are carried out uh, in textile uh, for uh, finishing uh, and, uh, and dyeing. And the third is fiber production, mainly represented by cotton cultivation that, uh, of course, uh, absorbs uh, and uh, takes uh, a big quantity of water. Uh, for uh, uh, indeed the, 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 the cultivation. True, there are countries where cotton is, uh, uh, is uh, rain fed, but those countries provide to the global a small portion of cotton. And, uh, the, yes, I see Marco that wants to say something. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, well, as, as we said before, this is a representation uh, of the overall, or you can take it as an average impact for the. Uh, uh, textile supply chain. Of course, in, if you just take into consideration uh, a supply chain of a, of a garment made of synthetics, you have almost zero uh, yeah. in the impact on, on fresh water because uh, there is almost no use of water in producing uh, chemical or man-made fibers. On the other hand, if, we, if you take uh, just a, 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 a cotton T-shirt, so this number, the 21%, will go up uh, to, a, to, a higher, uh, to a higher number. And, of, and then if you take, in, uh, if this is cotton, as uh, Pierre was mentioning before, is manufacturing according to the latest technologies, maybe you have a, a, an impact of, on water which is half or even less than half done a, the, the, the same ton of cotton uh, uh, grown uh, with traditional or non-up-to-date uh, uh, growing techniques or irrigation techniques. Yeah. Thank you, Marco. So uh, we said the climate uh, impact, uh, impact on fresh water, and uh, I just wanted to make uh, uh, you know, a clarification about the methodology that has been used uh, to calculate uh, and to provide you with those data. Uh, basically, it's the life cycle analysis that uh, has been uh, applied, the LCA that studies, uh, uh, that has informed the hotspot that uh, analysis has considered uh, in the sources that we have uh, taken into consideration. 
application. Basically, the LCA works by uh, considering the extraction of resources. Here you see raw materials, water, chemicals, and energy, and uh, the releases that, that uh, uh, to the air, water, and soil, and then quant they are quantified at each life cycle stage. And here you have uh, uh, the, the stages of fiber production, yarn production, uh, fabric production, and so on and so forth. So extraction of resources, releases to, or, uh, to, to air, water, and soil, quantified for each single process. And this is basically what is the research or the methodology that's been applied for the data that we are showing you. And that is also, uh, let's say, captured in the business process analysis, because the business process analysis, uh, they have a big part uh, on, uh, on risk, on sustainability risks, uh, and on, uh, let's say, guiding all companies that, to, that I hope, uh, will uh, go through having a, a, a corporate strategies or action plan on traceability and transparency, will have also, uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, to analyze what the problems or the risks uh, in their supply chains could be, considering always, of course, all these variables that we are talking about, uh, specifically geographic location, but also, as Marco said, they mentioned before, uh, the, um, the innovation that they pursue, such as you know, having machinery that uh, consumes low energy and that maybe uses low water, or adopting mitigation strategies and measures for uh, uh, chemical management and chemical use. The next slide that I want to share with you about uh, risks is related to social risks. Social risks, uh, uh, as we saw before in the matrix, uh, are basically uh, across uh, all the stages of the value chain. Uh, as Marco said before, we have adopted uh, this uh, linear value chain because it's uh, very much respondent of the status quo, even though, of course, we are uh, trying to work towards a more ci a circular, not a more, a circular one, uh, because this is not circular at all. But again, uh, it is uh, representative of the status quo and also allows us to, you know, uh, focalize and collocate in the proper manner uh, uh, the, the impacts, uh, as, as Marco did before, the, the stakeholders and all the you know, relevant um, uh, parts of the value chain. So about the social risks. Uh, we know, of course, that the garment industry is a very substantial uh, uh, job creator. Um, I guess uh, there are uh, around the globe uh, more than 25 million people involved in all the different stages uh, of the textile and leather value chain. So big contribution to employment in many countries and uh, in particular in developing countries, which is very important, uh, and in particular with uh, women, a big, big proportion also of women employed, which is another good factor. However, uh, the textile value chain has been frequently linked to uh, you know, uh, poor working conditions, to child labor, specifically in the cotton cultivation, but also in the textile uh, companies, uh, mills and has been attracting the attention of NGOs and media. Uh, all of you probably remember what happened in 2013 uh, with the collapse of the Rana Plaza and all uh, what, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the effects that this, has, uh, that, that this had, that this fact uh, brought about given that there were the thousand who died in that collapse. So, of course, the attention of uh, the media, but also of the consumers and also of the producers, uh, has increased uh, notably after those problems. But we still see that, of course, uh, we have a natural fiber production, cotton cultivation, that is dominant for the social risks, uh, which, and the, then is followed by yarn and fabric production, and then garment assembly. Um, the risks uh, here are calculated, uh, uh, are uh, split between average social risk, risk of excessive working time, and risk of injury. Average social, social risk is basically uh, an average between different KPIs for child labor and um, unpaid uh, work, uh, uh, social security. If you check, uh, of course, the BPAs and uh, the report that I'm referring to, which is the report of the UNEP, you will find uh, the exact meaning and the exact KPIs that have been used to uh, calculate this average social risk. 
Uh, another point here, uh, which is the same comment that I gave you before, uh, that we have always to bear in mind uh, is the ge geographic location. Now, for instance, for young, for cotton, we know where cotton happens, uh, and uh, the majority, uh, majority of cotton in the world is uh, cultivated in, in, the, in countries where uh, there are many uh, conditions that not always they want to bring child labor. Sometimes is uh, is a social, let's say, habit, uh, and because uh, I want to distinguish the child labor or the forced labor is an organized, uh, uh, you know, uh, system. While when we see the, a farmer bring uh, uh, his child in the uh, in the um, cotton uh, cotton field probably is not exactly child labor. He's uh, you know a child or a, a young boy who is helping his father to make a living. Of course, it's unacceptable, but we have always to consider when we calculate calculate our risks. Uh, where we are going to source the material and where we are going to transform, industrially transform that material. Because also the big, uh, the high uh, proportion in the, um, in the fiber production or in the intermediate materials production is related to the fact that there is a big pressure on prices in the market. So um, companies and industries are uh, pushed to, uh, let's say, delocalize their business where uh, the, the cost of work is lower because, uh, uh, so this is again a discussion to be, uh, to be um, uh, taken by the all value chain starting from the brands. So the discussion that we did in these days about the necessity to work in partnership, to work with a value chain approach applies so much also to the risks because only if we have a value chain approach and we have the willingness of all the parts and the actors and the stakeholders in the value chain, we can really mitigate those risks. True is that we have a lot of uh, uh, a lot of mitigation measures, uh, such as uh, you know um, uh, voluntary certifications and so. But uh, again, uh, we really need to uh, to, to want uh, and to, cha to change the matters. I have taken another slide that is just uh, has been uh, probably already shown, I think, yesterday by the authors of this report, uh, which is uh, the impacts uh, that have been uh, increased by also uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, they, they, these are all uh, impacts that are already existing, of course, but that they have been, uh, you know, uh, exacerbated by, uh, by the, the COVID pandemic. In particular, one that has been, uh, that has been in increasing exponentially is the alarming amount of uh, uh, fabric waste, uh, which is at the end of life, uh, caused uh, by increased demand in personal protective equipment. Now, let's imagine all what we will have, uh, not only in the landfills, but spread around the planet in terms of, uh, uh, you know, this disposable but also not non-disposable protective equipment and we will have to decide all together what we want to do with that. So all the other risks are the, the ones that I already mentioned uh, apart from the disruption in the, in the supply chains that happened of course uh, uh, in particular in the, on the textile because of the lockdown uh, in countries. So we have had companies that couldn't produce and consumers that, that couldn't buy. So it has been basically a perfect storm. So um, all this has created a crazy increase in, uh, in raw materials that we are all experiencing, experiencing on the market, includes, of course, includes the cotton and other chemicals that are used in textile. Here you can see a collection of the main, uh, let's say, um, certifications and the frameworks and initiatives uh, that uh, start that uh, are very well uh, let's say based in the textile uh, market textile and leather we will see also in the next slide um, this is these are related to fiber standards uh, uh, to the part of the fiber production and the initiative in this category have uh, um, quite uh, a, a big a broad scope uh, some of them and they incorporate not only the ecological or let's say the environmental uh, part but also the social economic and labor rights issues some of them allow uh, 
the product claim, some others uh, instead that they have a chain of custody that is based on the or on mass balance, they do not, uh, of course, uh, allow to have product claims. I guess yesterday Virginia uh, explained very well uh, what was the uh, different traceability model in terms of uh, uh, mass balance and instead uh, segregation of materials uh, for the traceability. Uh, this is very much applied, of course, uh, this may very much useful for the cotton and I guess also for, uh, for leather uh, raw materials. Um, I don't know if, uh, if, if you have a segregation uh, like in textile for the chain of custody. Or fiber makeup because okay. we, we don't have that same makeup. So that's why there are no leather standards on this one. I but see. We do on the next okay. One. Yeah. In this one, instead, you see uh, in the center uh, what is uh, common to the two uh, to the two uh, value chains, textile and leather. Uh, in particular, uh, ZDHC and Oecotex that are related to chemical management and chemical use, uh, and then social uh, certifications. And on the other hand, instead, uh, you have uh, all um, uh, frameworks and certifications that they apply uh, to textile processes and to leather processes. To conclude, uh, just uh, to connect also to the next part uh, of my colleague Deborah, I wanted to make the point uh, on the fact that all those analyses, all those risks uh, that we have been seeing and that whoever will uh, approach uh, the BPA analysis will have to do, um, can be documented by some data. They have to be documented, uh, of course, by data if we want them to have uh, certain claims. So uh, the BPAs uh, make a distinction between uh, basic traceability data that uh, relates uh, to uh, records about the product uh, that can be input and output documentation uh, or uh, the, what the output or the first input becomes uh, in a new input. Uh, uh, the processing, the different processes that, uh, you know, are applied to the products, by whom are they applied. Optionally, also for the chain of custody uh, data, you can be collected. And then the, the, the second group of, uh, instead, is related to sustainability data that can vary according to the final claim that we want to adopt. Here is just an example, but uh, it, it goes without saying that if I want to speak about factories that implement good labor practices, I will uh, concentrate and uh, you know, collect the data that is focused on conditions in factories. While if I have to have a claim on a product that is made of 100% organic cotton, I will uh, look at the value chain, uh, uh, sorry, at the um, uh, custody of that uh, material starting from the raw material itself. So um, in, the, in the collection of the, of the documentation, of course, as it, it has already been said by, I guess, always Virginia, <laughs> the five uh, W's or the questions that the five W's, uh, you know, bring about are very useful, meaning that we ask ourselves, uh, who is my value chain partner? What is the uh, type of material or the event that I want to document? How is this process done or this product done? And also, as we said before, the business location is really very important. So I guess I finished my part and we can now, yes? Yes? The results of the poll. Yes, uh, oh, okay, yes, sorry. we can go to the yeah. results of the poll. <laughs> I was going to say it. <laughs> we can go to the results of the poll. Um, yes? You will show them on screen, I guess. Yes. Okay, so uh, we see here 48% is uh, related to climate change and it's a staggering, you know, <laughs> uh, percentage, 48%, which is very important. Of course, I guess uh, uh, climate change is, uh, uh, how to say, very close to and very near to all of us, uh, in front of us every day with uh, crazy, you know, uh, uh, weather um, uh, changes and uh, very, they impact a lot on our lives. Uh, um, I want to see labor rights is seven percent of human rights. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's expected because uh, 
maybe for people living in Europe uh, or in countries where legislation on uh, labor rights and human rights uh, is uh, quite uh, very well organized and respected uh, uh, by the majority of uh, companies and industries, uh, uh, it is not really in front of our eyes, but for documented people that are reading and seeing and understanding, probably I, will, I would have expected uh, this uh, to be a little bit uh, higher. Uh, we see 16% animal welfare, 8% uh, again uh, well, resource depletion, and 3 hazardous chemistry. Uh, comments? Yes? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment on that because from a leather industry perspective, if we'd have posed this question uh, even two years ago, hazardous chemistry would have been right up there. At, at, at the top. The chemistry. Um, and the, yeah, the, the climate change would have been very low on the environmental and sustainability pri priorities mm. for the leather industry. I'm talking about that specific at the moment. What I think we're seeing is more understanding and education that actually we already have good measures in place for chemistry within both sectors, uh, but, but talking about the leather. We do have really good legislation in place, and we have really good testing in place for hazardous chemistry. Animal welfare is a new rising concern, I think, and, and a lot of that, I think, hooks in with deforestation and the other linked concerns um, around animal welfare. Uh, but the climate change, obviously, we all know um, how important that's become and how much more aware people are of it in the last couple of years. And I think that that's a really difficult one for brands to overcome, especially when they are working in global value chains because climate change is, is, having, is being impacted by the consumption, the levels of consumption, the global trade. So we don't want to go back to a localised situation and, and economy, but we certainly need to start having those hard discussions about whether or not it's still appropriate to source from somewhere on the opposite side of the world because you can force them down cost-wise and, and, and make those margins preferable from a brand perspective. Um, I, I think if, if we start, and that hooks into the social yeah. dimension very well, but I think that these challenges are, are really changing our focus on, on what we need to be thinking yeah. about. No, just to comment on what you said, Deborah, it's a, a two-way process. I mean, you, you, you mentioned brands, but also consumers have to be consumers. educated yeah. because uh, as long as we will have the demand for specific, uh, you know, uh, textiles or specific uh, that maybe they cost uh, three euros, but they have, to, uh, they have been produced without respecting the environment, respecting the people that are making those, uh, th those clothes. I mean, uh, so uh, it's, yeah. uh, it's a matter of education. Education has been mentioned a lot uh, today and it's very, and, really and very yesterday. important in communication. Yeah. So it's a two ways, the brands, but also the consumer, because as long as there is demand, people will continue producing. That's right. I see that Marco wants to make a point as well. Please, Marco. Yeah. The, the first, uh, very first impression is that animals beat humans 16 yeah. to seven. That's ah. quite, quite interesting. But, but apart from this, this joke, uh, I think that this tells us a couple of, of, of gives us a couple of suggestions. First, uh, that maybe uh, the, the uh, sustainability concerns are strongly interlinked and uh, not always uh, clear. Because of course, in this case, I assume that we can sum up hazardous chem chemistry that as a surprising, uh, very low, uh, let's say, concern. Uh, to the health and safety, for example. Uh, and yeah. this can be, so uh, the first point is that it is good news for, for our project because we need to, uh, to set in more precise way uh, the, the boundaries between the different points. And the second, uh, if we have, we have to consider the 3% of adult chemistry that surprise this me more than the 16 for the animal welfare, uh, I wonder if, compared to the 8% of resource depletion, this, uh, maybe it shows us uh, that sustainability uh, in the fashion business is what I call usually a, a moving target. We, have, we, we had 
a period starting 10 years ago, exactly 10 years ago in 1911, uh, following a huge campaign by Greenpeace, maybe you, all you know the, the detox campaign, mm -hmm. uh, where chemicals, the problem of chemicals has become the, by large, by far, the first most important concern within the industry that and has, uh, uh, and gave rise to a, num a huge number of initiatives, right? Uh, nowadays, on the chemicals issue, uh, the, the framework is much more uh, fixed and, and clarified. There is still a lot of work, but the idea is that something has already changed among the uh, professionals, <clears throat> I would say. Uh, while now we are entering the era, uh, the age of circularity, and connected to circularity, uh, resource depletion is the first point, because circularity is the efficient use of resources, in very short terms. So maybe this, 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 this and of course, uh, climate change is very, very long, very, very wide topic. So maybe it shows us that things are changing in terms of the, the, the focus of people yeah. uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the fashion yeah. business. Okay, just to sum up, so as you, were, as you were saying, Marco, our questions were quite uh, fragmented. So maybe uh, if we put together uh, human rights, uh, labor rights, uh, and I mean, all what is related to the social dimension of sustainability, because uh, probably, I mean, uh, the percentage is a little bit more encouraging. Another point that I think it's important also for uh, um, all our uh, partners, but for the project itself, uh, uh, is that uh, maybe we have also as a project uh, to stimulate more discussion about the social part because again, we see government, we see um, everybody's moving, uh, COP21 and everything. We have a lot of uh, big uh, uh, initiatives by governments, by big partners on the environment. Where are the ones about the people? Have you seen one? Maybe it's, I, I don't know, but <laughs> I didn't hear about all the, you know, governments and the big countries in the world getting together and deciding uh, how they should, uh, you know, be, things should be done in certain countries where people are exploited, uh, where children are in companies, uh, or where you, women are, uh, you know, discriminated. I haven't seen, yes, I, I, I listen a lot of, uh, you know, talks and reports and so, but not uh, uh, real measures. So probably Probably this is an indication also for us in the project to, uh, you know, create some more uh, uh, discussion about this. Okay, I guess I, I finished. If you have, uh, yes? Next slide. Yes, I, uh, there are other slides. Yes, there were two questions actually. I don't know if I went up. Wait. So that's the minimum. This is the related to? Uh, this is Minimum data. Yes, yes, but I don't know if it's the, num the, num that the raw materials the, or the that processes. That was the origin. That, that, that result was question one, the, the origin il, of the uh, materials. No, sourcing. voglio vedere il, la prima, la seconda. Sì. No, 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 we want this first one. Question one from poll two. Yeah. That was what that, that's this So one. this is yeah. question one of uh, poll that's number it. two. Okay. Yeah. So we have, uh, um, by the 37%, paper-based evidence, which is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, if I tell you that uh, this is uh, cotton coming from, you want to see the invoice. Uh, that's uh, the minimum acceptable, basically. Uh, then we have a 33% electronic evidence of batch identifiers, which is, uh, 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 I look at Virginia, but I think this is a very big, uh, you know, uh, it's a very granular, I mean, we are going into a high granularity of, uh, of evidences, correct? Well, here we're talking about the minimum. So that means, you know, maybe you accept paper and electronic, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, I'm talking yeah. about, yes, uh, the, the batch identifiers. I mean, oh, we, yes, that, that, because that's uh, it. the point is not the electronic, the point is the batch. The, the, yes. People are that's asking about the batch. That's for your input and output to match yeah. them so that yeah, yeah. you have the... Yeah, yeah. exactly. And then uh, the 17% embedded or physical markers. So we will have also a session mm -hmm. tomorrow on physical markers and pilots that have uh, happened uh, in the project about the use of, uh, of physical markers on cotton. 
And uh, uh, okay, 13% text email communication. It's, uh, this is, uh, uh, I don't know, is there another one? There's one uh, more, yeah. yes, we've got the question too, so one more slide. This, yeah, this is the question That's too, it. perfect, yeah. okay. Um, the 44% is uh, with second party certification, the self-assessment reports uh, uh, done uh, by a company and then uh, assessed, uh, verified, uh, let's say verified by a second party. The 40% is expecting to have third party certification external lab testing, uh, which is uh, basically what uh, can prove, uh, I mean, uh, normally uh, the uh, substantiate uh, sustainability claims. Uh, 6% uh, self-assessment report only, and 10% uh, self-declaration. Okay, so we are moving towards uh, uh, the third-party certification and the second-party uh, self-assessment. Yeah. That's, I think, what I would expect um, in, in terms of evidencing good practice in sustainability. I, th I think you can't take something on face value with a self-certification. No. It's a good first step, especially if you're just starting this process. But as particularly when we're, when we're thinking about the, the use of blockchain technology and other advanced technologies to support the process, then you really do want to have the robustness behind that claim that's yeah. being made. Correct. Because as somebody said yesterday, once the data's up there, it's up there. So you, you uh, I agree be with you. To, somebody to said that if you put in uh, rubbish, it stays yes, rubbish, yes. <laughs> right? So yeah. again, yeah. if you put fake documents inside a blockchain, uh, yeah. blockchain platform, uh, it is still yeah. fake yeah. documents. So that is why probably yeah. these 44 well. and 40% are oriented towards either second party or third party. Yes? Uh, no, the only thing that surprises me is the 10% and the 6%. Because self-declaration means that you say that you comply without any data or assessment you just say it. Whereas the self-assessment report means that you do a report that says, you know, these are the KPIs and I meet them in this way. And so it's a little bit surprising to me that the no data seems to be more, ex <laughs> more acceptable than the self-assessment with data. But it's... Uh, they're, yeah, they're both, uh, I guess, I guess uh, um, the understanding uh, of uh, a document called yeah. uh, a self-declaration is much easier yeah. than uh, uh, a self-assessment report yeah. because uh, probably also our audience, uh, they are not all technical people. Yeah. So, uh, actually, this is the uh, dominant standard in the current industry, even by uh, companies that are very concerned about sustainability. Uh, the, if, you, if you take the minimum requirement is some sort of uh, a, a declaration that the, suppliers, the supplier uh, takes the responsibility of making a declaration. So that, that's, that's very common, common behavior at the moment. This is what, what you, you receive, you typically receive the, uh, the contract uh, with an annex that says, please, uh, uh, sign this declaration about chemicals or whatever. So you are responsible. If I find that something is wrong, uh, I, I, I can come back to you. That. Okay. Thank you very much. I guess uh, my presentation is uh, over. I will uh, give the floor now to Deborah to conclude uh, hers. Yes. Thank you, Piera. Okay. Um, let's move on. And we will look at the last stage in this process. So uh, we've identified our processes, we've identified our actors, uh, we've then done our risk assessment based on our activities and, and our uh, value chain, as we've identified. We now need to start putting that together. And this got even more complex in reality. So let's have a look. We used the use case diagrams that we looked at earlier to form the basis for the business process descriptions. These are the detailed analysis of those individual processes. And this is where we start getting a little bit more granular and layering these components together. And this is the first part, creating an activity diagram. Now, earlier I said we, we made farming one simple process. That was our process one. Now we've broken that process down into a 1A and a 1B. 1A represents whole life farming, 
1B represents a more industrialised farming system. The two things are completely different and they have different activities within them. There's an exchange, there's a sale of, of, of livestock from one farm to another in the industrialised system that you don't get in, in the whole farm. And as I mentioned earlier, the more times material or livestock moves hands, the more potential for risk you've got. So it's, it's really important. So these activity diagrams now take each of those processes and drills down into all of the activities contained within that process. And we use these swim lanes to show the chronological progression with the different actors that are taking part along those processes. So you can see there, we, we've, we've titled, it's gonna be difficult to read this, you can access them, and I'm more than happy to have a talk with anybody at any time about these diagrams. Um, but you can see we've got transporters in there, we've got the slaughterhouse in there, we've got the farmer, uh, other suppliers. Uh, so we, we put those across in those swim lanes and then we literally just take that process through from start to finish to where it moves on to the next of those processes. Once we've done the activity diagram, we then have to create the detailed process descriptions beneath it. So you can see there that even though we're talking about the whole life farm, that could be one of four options, A, B, C, and D, that you can see there in that, in that short description. So it could be uh, private, small family holdings, or it could be exotic systems. So we've got to remember that there are many ways that we can get to, to the end of the life of the animal. And beneath that, we put the process participants, our actors. We also put the input, very easy when we're looking at farming, that's going to be uh, the, the planning of a herd and, and birth of the animals. And we also put any parallel processes. So you can see there that inspection and certification processes are listed as a parallel process because they could be taking part at different points on a farm for different applications. Beneath that, Every one of those individual activity boxes that you saw in the activity diagram has its own description. And this is where we start now creating our documentation. So what are the required documents? What other information might be being uh, passed through? And what communication methods might we be using there? And what actions could there be as a result of that transfer of, of data? Some of these descriptions are like four or five pages long, but they all culminate the same way, and that's what this slide here shows you. So we look at any of those common exceptions or problems. Um, for example, not related to farming, but if we think about a, a tannery process, let's suppose a tanner splits his material into a top grain and, and a bottom split, and then sells it on. If you have an identifier on that, on that hide, you might have lost that off the bottom piece of that leather as it then moves into the system. Or you could end up double counting material. So it's making notes of any common exceptions or problems on this document as well. And of course, any circular economy related information that we know about. Um, we then look at those sustainability risks that we've now assessed, as Pierre has just told you about. And we also give links and ideas about the organizations that are out there that mitigate those risks. That's not a fully inclusive list. You can't be fully exhaustive, but it's good examples of well-recognized organizations that can support with that mitigation. So, Let's think about how we're layering up now. We've created our use case diagram, we've identified our risks, we've created our activity diagrams, and then moved on to our detailed business process descriptions. All of that work is like a 200-page report from myself and Marco, so we've tried to condense that into bite-sized information for you today, but it really is quite detailed work. Some of that work ends up being a little bit repetitive because you're doing the same thing for the same processes over and over again, but it is really valuable and worthwhile. And now what we have to do is take all of that information and overlay it with the generic data requirements that was outlined by Virginia uh, earlier on and, and that form the basis for the standard. And how do we do that? Well, first we take our own case, so our own business model, what we're doing, 
and we map it through those generic pathways for data exchange. So you can see here, I've, I've blown it up a little bit just to show you the first couple of, of steps here. We're looking at traceability entry points here. So you can see that 3.1 could be split either way. You could either be registering a traceable asset for which you already have an identifier from further back. In this case, it could be a farm. Or you might be assigning an ID to a traceable asset because you're the entry point and you don't have any information or identifier before you take receipt of it. So you could go either way. And you follow that pathway through to what's relevant for your particular business case. And then once you've done that, you then take that information and pop it back onto those activity diagrams. So the three nodes that you can see there represent those first three uh, green boxes on, on the uh, generic diagram here. So 3.1.1, 3.1.2, and 3.2. So here you can see 3.1.1 is the registration of an ID. You've got 3.1.2, which is the assigning a traceable ID. And you've also got 3.2, which is the verification um, of the asset, so, and that could be done through the inspection services. So that's kind of how you overlay the generic information onto your actual business model to see whether or not you're collecting the information at the points you need to collect it to provide that traceability, which will ultimately give you the, the foundations for transparency, because you can't start layering that information up until you've got this work in place. It's, it's worth remembering that there are different entry and exit points and that what we're encouraging here is that as a system and a standard, if you can't get right back to the farm right now, that's not a problem. Start from where you can and at least you can demonstrate that perspective and then you can evolve, you can grow it out and try to encourage the engagement of those partners moving forward. So, conclusions. Uh, do you want to take the conclusions, Virginia? Shall I wrap? No, you can go through the, yeah? this okay. part, yeah. So from, from both perspectives, leather and textile, having done this work uh, and given the fact that we know we had to make some generalizations, um, what we did conclude is that there is the potential for good data availability across those value chains in both leather and textile. Where the gaps do commonly exist right now, it does tend to be in those upstream areas, um, which haven't always been as, uh, as connected to the direct processes as we would like. So where there are gaps, there's the potential to plug those gaps definitely, but it is going to require working with those upstream partners a little bit more closely. Um, and these BPAs, they're really important. They are complex, they're time consuming, but they do give you the tools that you need to be able to then move forward, engage your partners in a really valuable way moving forward. And with that, I shall say thank you very much and hand back to Virginia. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. I think now we have a, a good overview of what is a business process analysis, how it's been done with established uh, value chain processes. Could we go back to that slide? I don't think I touched this. Hmm. <laughs> no, there's one more. There we go. Okay. Let's not move. <laughs> it's the last one. Uh, so, it, and we've identified the risks and the mitigation options and the information and the data. Now tomorrow, tomorrow you get the opportunity, and I think beginning maybe today, to look at uh, the pilot projects that are being launched under this process. And I hope you'll be able to see the links between this work and, and that work in terms of identifying the, the data that, that, that's needed. And I'd like to thank uh, all of our, our three panelists and, and, and Claudia 
for the excellent presentations on this topic. Okay. Thank you, Virginia. Just uh, whether you have the questions on the Q&A from the audience that you would like to take and maybe, yes, Piera, before we conclude. Yeah, I don't think I, I saw that because we're out of time also. Yeah. No, <laughs> you have five more minutes. I have five more minutes, yeah. wow. Do <laughs> you have the questions? Yes, I, I have don't. the questions here. You want okay, them? I need my glasses. <laughs> so here. Okay. Uh, on hot Deborah. spots. The first one is Deborah. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, to Deborah, the presentation elaborated com comprehensively on hot spots related to environmental and social aspects. Could you talk about the hot spots related to economic aspects? Ah, okay. <laughs> wow. Now there's a question. Um, economic aspects are challenging to say the least when we're thinking about implementing one? systems of this nature and implementing sustainability as a general concept. I think we touched yesterday on communication and uh, the input from uh, consumers, the understanding um, of, of the fact that this does cost and how do, we, how do we find that revenue? How do we make it work? And I think that there is a realization that that has to start with the whole chain coming together and accepting that if you want good sustainability across all those areas, you have to pay for it. You have to pay those workers in those areas. You have to pay the tanneries for that material in such a way that they can afford good social practices for their workforces. And that then comes all the way up through the line. If you're expecting identifiers, embedded markers, if you're expecting uh, a blockchain system, then you have to be expecting to pay a little bit more for that. And so if we can educate that this happens together at scale to the consumer, and so that they do understand that if they're going into a store and paying five pounds for a t-shirt, then possibly there could be some risk with buying that T-shirt. Whereas if they're, if, if they're able to pay £25 for that T-shirt and know that they're getting the assurance from that brand that they're buying it from, that that T-shirt has gone through a sustainable production model, then I think consumers... We, we've, we've had polls. We've, we've done surveys. We know consumers say that they are happy to pay a few more pounds for an item that has sustainability attached to it. We've got to make that happen. It's got to become a reality. Okay. Then we have a question from a statistician about what is the end population and its dispersion in taking this survey. I'd like to point out that this, is, this wasn't a survey. It was a poll. And it has absolutely no statistical validity whatsoever <laughs> other than <laughs> it's, a, it's a poll of the points of view of the people participating in the, in the conference. And then <clears throat> I wanted to make a short comment about the economic risk. The economic risk is partly related to something I mentioned uh, before lunch, which is using business process analysis also to identify problems in your business, uh, in your value chain, where there are duplicative processes that are taking place. And <clears throat> if you have a place in your value chain where you frequently have problems, it could help you to identify what is happening there that creates that problem. Where is the breakdown in the communication of information or the transfer of, uh, of goods? And then <clears throat> there was a question about uh, the, claim, the relationship between claims and BPAs. It says, how do you tackle claims and, BP, and the BPA for a value chain? The BPA is what is happening now. It's an analysis of the current situation. And you, can, you have to decide for yourself as a company, based on your knowledge, 
what are the principal risks, your, your reputation risks, your <clears throat> environmental risks, and you have to use your knowledge of your value chain to identify what are the points in the value chain where those risks take place. And you have to do that separately for each claim, for, for each risk. But the value chain allows you to identify more precisely where those risks might take place and what information you should gather, you could gather about the risk based on what's happening in your, in your value chain. I hope that answers that question and those were the three questions. Thank you very much, uh, Virginia. So perfectly on time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for managing so well and thank you uh, for leading us through this session uh, and Piera and Deborah and Marco. And thank you uh, really for the work on this uh, very complex uh, documents that are now there available uh, and that uh, will guide you through how uh, to do a business process analysis. We have seen that this is about uh, analyzing uh, your business processes, what are the actors, the main actors along your value chain, analyzing uh, your risks along the value chain, identifying the key data points uh, where actually to collect and exchange data with your value chain actors based on your risk analysis uh, uh, for the traceability and transparency purposes. And that will lead us into the next session, uh, which is about uh, uh, the, uh, the, the data model, the business requirements and data model. Uh, and is about uh, uh, you know the data that uh, you will have to collect and exchange at these key data points so with actors uh, and partners for the traceability and transparency purposes. And that session is uh, with uh, uh, Gerard Hemskirk and Claudia Di Bernardino from the UNEC project team. And then we have three panelists that will interact with Claudia and Gerard, Piero De Sabata in Eurotex, Katie Shaw from the Open Apparel Registry, and Julie Brown from the E.ON Group. So again, uh, a rich panel discussion. But before uh, opening uh, the, the coffee break and inviting you for the coffee, Coffee break. Just a note. I was uh, quite, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, it was in interesting to see the outcome of the poll uh, on uh, sensitivities around uh, the sustainability risk and see how much attention climate change uh, uh, is now uh, raising compared to the social, uh, uh, human rights, uh, uh, labor dimension. But I want to mention that there are, of course, very important initiatives out there that have been a key reference for the work under the project. Uh, the guiding principles on uh, business and human rights, the, of course, the ILO conventions, uh, and the Better Work Initiative at the ILO, focusing on uh, fundamental uh, labor uh, standards uh, um, and social standards, the OECD due diligence uh, guidelines that uh, have actually started with a focus on the human uh, and social rights. And there is a lot of national policy and legislation happening on due diligence and with a focus on human rights, anti-slavery, uh, uh, child labor. So it's important to mention that uh, uh, there is an important framework out there also for the social and human rights dimension that has been underpinning uh, the work under the project and is reflected in the traceability and transparency approach and standard we have developed. Just to conclude, thank you for your attention. Have a, a nice coffee break and looking forward to reconnect for the final session of the day. Thank you very much.